Monday, July 15th, the federal judge in Florida dismisses the classified documents case against former President Donald Trump, siding with his defense lawyers who said the special counsel who filed the charges was illegally appointed by the Justice Department. Special counsel Jack Smith's office says it will appeal. The dismissal today by U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon brings a stunning and abrupt halt to a criminal case that at the time it was filed was widely regarded as the most perilous of all the legal threats that the former Republican president confronted. Jubilant Republican delegates formally nominate Donald Trump to the Republican presidential ticket at their national convention in Milwaukee soon after he announces that Ohio Senator J.D. Vance is his running mate. The delegates' votes today make it official that Trump will lead the Republican Party in a third consecutive election. Delegates express gratitude they could vote for the former president after he was the target of an assassination attempt at a rally over the weekend. Hamas says Gaza ceasefire talks are still on despite a massive Israeli airstrike that killed at least 90 people, including children. Meanwhile, a United Nations assessment finds that a fleet of more than 100 trucks would take 15 years to just clear the Gaza Strip of almost 40 million tons of rubble caused by the Israeli bombardment in an operation that would cost at least a half billion dollars. The Right Wing Heritage Foundation previews efforts to overturn the 2024 election with a top official saying there is a 0% chance of a free and fair election. The foundation, which is also behind the extreme project 2025, suggests it's Biden who would try to overturn the election, echoing Trump's repeated claims that it is actually Biden who's a threat to democracy. The second phase of the National Rifle Association's corruption trial gets underway in New York today, where a judge is to determine whether ex-leadership should face non-monetary penalties for misspending prominent gun rights organizations' money. And California Governor Gavin Newsom signs a law barring school districts from passing policies that require schools to notify parents if their child asks to change their gender identification. From Pacifica Radio in the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. A U.S. judge in Florida today dismissed the criminal case accusing Donald Trump of illegally keeping classified documents after leaving office, handing the Republican former president another major legal victory as he seeks a return to the White House. U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon, who was appointed to the bench by Trump, ruled the special counsel Jack Smith, who's leading the prosecution, was unlawfully appointed to his role and did not have the authority to bring the case. The Justice Department said it would appeal the decision. The judge found that U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, who named Smith in 2022 to oversee investigations involving Trump, did not have the authority to appoint a federal officer with the kind of prosecutorial power wielded by special counsel Smith. It marked another blockbuster legal triumph for Trump. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled on July 1st that Trump has broad immunity from criminal prosecution for official actions that he took as president. The ruling came in a separate case against Trump, also pursued by Smith, involving Trump's efforts to overturn his 2020 election loss. A spokesperson for Smith said Cannon's ruling deviates from the uniform conclusion of all previous courts that have considered the issue. 
Courts have consistently found the Attorney General has the authority to appoint special counsels to handle certain investigations. Trump, in a social media post, said the ruling should be just the first step, called for the dismissal of all four criminal cases against him. KPT's Ara Shaheen reports. I was really shocked and in disbelief. That's University of San Francisco professor Bill Hing. It's totally unprecedented, okay, to to rule that the, the office violates, uh, uh, violates due process. U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon said Attorney General Merrick Garland did not have the power to appoint special counsel Jack Smith. USF law professor Bill Hing and other legal experts say that the Supreme Court explicitly outlined the precedent in 1974 during the Watergate scandal in United States versus Nixon. The process and procedure under which Jack Smith was appointed is one that has been used over and over again. So why would Judge Cannon dismiss the case on those grounds, knowing that Special Counsel Smith can easily appeal the decision? Professor Hing said Judge Cannon has shown her partisanship and loyalty to Trump. And while he predicted an appeals court will reverse Cannon's ruling, he says the conservative majority on the Supreme Court could eventually protect the former president. She's taking a gamble that the U.S. Supreme Court will also show its partisanship and its favoritism to Donald Trump, and maybe they will agree with her. And so at the end of the day, uh, uh, maybe maybe that's the card that she's playing and she's banking on partisanship up to the Supreme Court. Professor Hing said there's irony in this situation, that Attorney General Garland appointed an independent special counsel in the first place out of concern for political partisanship. Hing says Garland could have led the prosecution himself, but instead wanted to show that there was independence from President Biden. Hing says that even if special counsel Jack Smith is unsuccessful in appeal, the attorney general would still be allowed to file the same charges himself. But by that point, analysts say Donald Trump could be back in the White House where he could appoint a new attorney general who could drop the case. This is the latest win of sorts for Trump in four separate criminal cases. He was convicted of 34 felonies back in May in his New York hush money trial, but sentencing in that case is postponed due to the Supreme Court's recent decision that former presidents have broad immunity from prosecution. Legal observers say the classified documents case against Trump is the easiest one to prosecute, given the amount of evidence and testimony from Trump's former aides and lawyers, and the fact that the alleged misconduct happened after Trump had left the White House. That may still be true, as the case was dismissed without any rulings on the facts of the case or the charges. Trump called for all four criminal cases against him to be dismissed on Monday. He argues they are all politically motivated witch hunts. Reporting for Pacifica Radio, KPFA, I'm Atta Shaheen. Cheering Republican delegates formally nominated Donald Trump for president at today's session of the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. Less than two days after an assassination attempt on the former president and shortly after Trump announced Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his vice presidential running mate. The vote makes it official that Trump, who has long been the presumptive nominee, will lead the GOP in a third consecutive election. The winner in 2016, he lost to current President Joe Biden in 2020. In November, he will again face Biden, apparently, who dismissed Vance as a clone of Trump on important issues. Even as the delegates were voting, Trump announced he had chosen as his running mate the young Ohio senator, who rose to national attention with his best-selling memoir, Hillbilly Elegy. Trump's son, Eric, announced Florida's votes, which put the former president over the top for the nomination. Video screens in the arena read over the top while the song celebration played and delegates danced and waved Trump signs. Throughout the voting, delegates flanked by Make America Great Again signs applauded as state after state voted their support for Trump's second term. Saturday's shooting at a Pennsylvania rally where Trump was injured and one man died was not far from delegates' minds as they celebrated. 
Delegates chanted, fight, 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 the same words that Trump was seen shouting to the crowd as the Secret Service on Saturday ushered him off the stage, his fist raised and his face bloodied. Trump's campaign chiefs had designed the convention to feature a softer and more optimistic message from Trump, focusing on themes that would help a divisive leader expand his appeal among moderate voters and people of color. Trump announced J.D. Vance as his running mate this afternoon just before he clinched the nomination. The former president's family and biggest allies quickly lauded the decision as a good one for the direction of the Republican Party. Haya Panjwani reports. Donald Trump has selected Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio as his Republican running mate. Vance swept to national prominence with his best-selling memoir, Hillbilly Elegy. Vance was once a vocal opponent of Trump during the 2016 presidential election, but changed his position, arguing he was proved wrong by Trump's performance in office. Vance was rewarded for his turnaround during his bid for an open Senate seat in 2022, during which he landed Trump's coveted endorsement. He is now a Trump loyalist who challenges the legitimacy of criminal prosecutions and civil verdicts against him and questions the results of the 2020 election. I'm Haya Panjwani. Hundreds of demonstrators converged on downtown Milwaukee to protest the Republican National Convention today, refusing to let the assassination attempt on Trump this weekend affect their long-standing plans to demonstrate outside the site. The activists called attention to issues such as abortion rights, economic justice, and the war in Gaza. The largest group was the Coalition to March on the RNC. The atmosphere festive with music playing over loudspeakers, a man strumming a guitar, and vendors selling T-shirts and buttons supporting both Republicans and Democrats. Activists carried signs that read, Stand with Palestine, We Can No Longer Afford the Rich, and defend and expand immigrant rights. KPFA's Audie McAfee reports. The Coalition to March on the Republican National Convention released a flyer in April calling on community members to join what it calls a family-friendly rally and march. The coalition is made up of 120 mostly Wisconsin-based activist groups. Speakers at the rally Monday were advocating for an end to the Israel-Hamas war, abortion, and immigration rights, and other issues in a park across from the Fizzer Forum where the convention will take place this week. Cody Urban is the vice chairperson for the International League of People's Struggle. He says unless a people's first system is created, there will never be true equity. We march against the 2024 RNC to expose its true character, but we do so also to rally the people of the U.S. to fight for a true people's platform for genuine social change. The coalition has led protests in St. Paul, Minnesota, Tampa, Florida, and Cleveland, Ohio. That's where the candidate Donald Trump secured the Republican nomination in 2016. Omar Flores is the co-chair of the coalition. He says his team has been planning and organizing this march for a long time. Two years later, we have over 120 organizations of the coalition and five well-defined points of unity. Defend women's, LGBTQ, and reproductive rights. Defend and expand immigrant rights. Peace, justice, and equity for all. Stand with Palestine! And to sum it all up, fight the racist and reactionary Republican agenda. The assassination attempt on former President Trump at a Pennsylvania rally on Saturday did not deter the marchers. The coalition expected 5,000 to 10,000 people to attend the Milwaukee protest. Kobe Guillory is a teacher from Chicago and a representative of the group Freedom Road Socialist Organization. He says the attempt on Trump's life did not deter them. What we are doing here is bigger than that, and we know how to keep each other safe. We've had these plans for years. We know what we're doing. We are very experienced at protesting. We're very experienced at fighting the power. We're having a family-friendly demonstration here, and that what happened on Saturday doesn't change our plans at all. Organizers said Milwaukee officials denied them march permits for more than a year until the American Civil Liberties Union filed a lawsuit against the city for violating protesters' First Amendment rights. On Friday, organizers reached an agreement with the city in which a city representative would follow along to make sure there were no problems during the march and protest. Many organizers condemned political violence. 
John Nichols is a national affairs correspondent for The Nation magazine. He told Democracy Now! on Monday that the candidates have an opportunity to tone down the overheated rhetoric. Well, the candidate who can, can pull us back from this, who can actually say, this isn't who we want to be, this isn't where we want to go, um, has a real potential to connect with people because I think people are feeling overwhelmed by the moment they're in. The Democratic National Convention will be held next month in Chicago. That event is expected to draw even more people, according to organizers. For KPFA, I'm Audie McAfee. Donald Trump and his new running mate, J.D. Vance, are reportedly going to take the stage briefly tonight at the Republican National Convention. If you want to catch them, the convention is being nationally televised. KPFA is providing coverage of the Republican National Convention and the upcoming Democratic National Convention in Chicago with Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! program, which is airing a two-hour conventional special program each morning. You can hear it 6 to 8 a.m. on KPFA with a repeat from 9 until 11 in the morning. CNN reports that in the 48 hours before he opened fire on former President Trump, the now-deceased assailant, 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks, made a series of stops in and around his suburban Pittsburgh hometown. A law enforcement official told CNN that on Friday he went to a shooting range where he was a member and practiced firing. The next morning, Crooks went to a Home Depot where he bought a five-foot ladder and a gun store where he purchased 50 rounds of ammunition. That's according to the official who said Crooks then drove his Hyundai Sonata about an hour north, joining thousands of people from around the region who flocked to Trump's rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. He parked the car outside the rally, allegedly with an improvised explosive device hidden in the trunk that was wired to a transmitter that he carried. Then investigators believe he used his newly bought ladder to scale a nearby building and opened fire on the former president. As investigators continue to search for a motive behind his attempted assassination, they're scrutinizing Crooks' movements before the attack and trying to piece together a timeline of his actions leading up to it. But law enforcement sources told CNN that even after successfully breaking into Crooks's telephone and searching his computer, scouring his search history and bedroom and interviewing his family and friends, agents still haven't found evidence that would suggest political or ideological impetus for the shooting. Julie Walker reports. The FBI says 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks from Bethel, Pennsylvania, a nursing home worker, is the man suspected of trying to assassinate former President Trump, FBI Deputy Director Paul Abate. Text and phone call uh, detail information that thus far has not refu- revealed anything with regard to uh, motive or the involvement or knowledge of anyone else. Crooks used an AR-style rifle authorities say they believe was purchased by his father, the roof where he was found about 160 yards from where Trump was speaking before he reported a bullet pierced his ear. High school classmates say Crooks was rejected by the rifle team for being a bad shot. Jason Kohler went to the same school and says Crooks was a loner. He was bullied sat alone at lunch. Records show Crooks was a registered Republican, but they also show he gave $15 to a progressive PAC. I'm Julie Walker. The Associated Press reports that it reviewed images of Crooks' dead body, which appeared to show he had been wearing a T-shirt from Demolition Ranch. That's a popular YouTube channel with more than 11.5 million subscribers that regularly posts videos that show the creator, Matt Character, firing off handguns and assault rifles at targets that include human mannequins and vehicles. Character, who lives in Texas, posted a photo of Crooks's bloody corpse wearing his brand's T-shirt on social media with the comment, What the hell? You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. The Heritage Foundation, a right-wing Washington think tank, previewed efforts to overturn the 2024 election last week, 
with a top official saying there was a 0% chance of a free and fair election. Mike Howell, executive director of the Oversight Project at the Heritage Foundation, made the comments at an event in Washington sharing the results of a hypothetical exercise involving several implausible events that could take place after the election. Those scenarios involved Barbara Streisand being kidnapped by Hamas, Antifa BLM protesters taking over a detention facility, and the FBI arresting Donald Trump after winning the election. The effort appears to be designed to muddy the waters over the threat to the 2024 election posed by Donald Trump, who has repeatedly refused to commit to accepting the election results and try to overturn the 2020 election results. Instead, the Heritage Foundation, which is also behind the extreme Project 2025, wants to suggest that it's Biden who could try to overturn the results of the election, echoing Trump's repeated claims that it is actually Biden who is the threat to democracy. Reporter Jackie Quinn has more. The Heritage Foundation, the conservative think tank behind the Project 2025 revision of the federal government, held a news conference suggesting President Biden might refuse to step down from power. A Heritage Foundation report accuses the Biden administration of lawlessness in its border policies, in staffing considerations, and in circumventing constitutional limits on the office of president, and then goes on to suggest the president could disregard the will of the voters, despite Biden clearly saying otherwise. President Biden has repeatedly said Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. Do you think democracy is seas based on Project 2025? Do you think he means what he says when he says he's going to do away with the civil service? Eliminate the Department of Education? But this appears to be an attempt to turn the tables. I'm Jackie Quinn. Civil rights groups are sounding the alarm about potential threats to American democracy posed by Project 2025. That's the roadmap created by the Heritage Foundation for the next Republican president. Eric Galatis has that story. The 900-page document calls for dismantling key protections against discrimination, access to reproductive health care, and more. Maya Wiley with the Leadership Council on Civil and Human Rights says Project 2025 aims to undo gains made 60 years ago with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, but she says this agenda isn't new. And either we're going to stand on the victory of ending slavery and of understanding the role of a federal government in ensuring that we all have civil rights, or we will not have a democracy. And this is a blueprint for ending it. Donald Trump has recently distanced himself from Project 2025 after praising the Heritage Foundation's plans in 2022. Heritage says the roadmap, which was co-authored by top Trump advisors, does not speak for any single candidate. It just provides recommendations. Many of those track closely with Trump's priorities, including removing regulations and checks on presidential power. AFL-CIO President Liz Schuler says Project 2025 also calls for expanding child labor and rolling back workplace protections under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, designed to prevent accidents, injury, and death. Tell that to a woman who lost her son in a grain silo that could have been prevented because he was cleaning it without the proper equipment. That is OSHA. These fines and these laws are there for a reason. Project 2025 would ban both abortion and in vitro fertilization nationally and restrict access to contraception. Patrick Gaspard with the Center for American Progress believes the roadmap's creators want to take the nation back not to 1964, but to 18. When men made decisions for women, when people who looked like me did not have the full agency and franchise of this great American republic, when huge corporations worked folks like farm animals. Support for this reporting was provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. This is Eric Galatis for the Colorado News Connection. Leaders at the fifth annual immigration summit, which wrapped up in Los Angeles on Friday, have vowed to stand strong no matter what happens with the November election, despite Donald Trump's promising to deport millions of immigrants if he prevails. Suzanne Potter reports. 
Donald Trump, the Republican candidate for president, has called for mass deportations. Miguel Santana with the California Community Foundation says this alarms many people in a county where more than one-third of the residents of all ethnicities are foreign-born, and about 60 percent of children have at least one immigrant parent. We've been engaged in scenario planning. We've prepared our immigrant community so that they know their rights, that we have the proper defense, but also we're advancing comprehensive immigration reform. That is really what's needed. The summit was co-sponsored by the California Community Foundation, the Council of Immigrant Inclusion, and USC's Equity Research Institute. Manuel Pastor, the Institute's director, says deportations would leave a huge hole in the economy and tear families apart. About a fifth of all Angelinos are either undocumented themselves or living with a family member who is undocumented. And so fear of deportation, problems with accessing services because of status affect a wide number of families. Researchers also released the fifth annual State of Immigrants in Los Angeles report, which finds naturalizations and wages for immigrants are up over the past few years. It also recommends continued support for county programs that provide legal aid and help people access services in their preferred language. This is Suzanne Potter reporting. Listening to the evening news on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. An Israeli drone strike on a car near the Lebanon-Syria border has killed a prominent serious businessman who was sanctioned by the United States and had close relations with Syrian President Bashar Assad's government. Details about the strike today came from pro-government media and an official from an Iranian-backed group. For years, Israel has launched frequent strikes on targets in Syria that have been linked to Iran, which is Syria's regional backer. But Israel rarely acknowledges those strikes. The attacks have escalated in recent months against the backdrop of the war on Gaza and ongoing clashes between Hezbollah and Israeli forces on the Lebanon-Israel border. Hamas says that Gaza ceasefire talks with Israel will continue, and the group's military commander is in good health. A day after the Israeli military targeted Mohammed Daif with a massive airstrike, <clears throat> local health officials say killed at least 90 people, including children. Deef's condition remains unclear after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said there still isn't absolute certainty he had been killed. Hamas representatives gave no evidence to back up their assertion about the health of the chief architect of the October 7th attack that sparked the current war. Israel's military said the strike killed another Hamas commander who was a close associate of Daif. Karen Chamas reports. Hamas has said ceasefire talks with Israel have not been paused and that its military chief survived an Israeli strike on Gaza that killed at least 90 people, including children. The claim came a day after the Israeli military said the strikes that killed scores of people in areas including a humanitarian zone were targeting Hamas leader Mohammed Dave. In the sprawling coastal tent camp known as Mawasi, a survivor of the strikes, Mohammed Abu Yassin, told the AP of his ordeal. I had the first hit and my son came screaming, Daddy, Daddy, and took cover with me. My daughter was next to me. I said, don't be afraid, and I hugged her. The second hit, I hugged them both together. The third hit, we did not know where we were. I woke up and found myself in the hospital. My son was killed immediately. The Israeli strikes in Gaza have not relented, as over a dozen more people were killed a day later at the gate of a school used as a shelter for displaced people, according to AP journalists in Gaza. I'm Karen Shamas. Philip Bennis is an American Jewish writer, activist, and political commentator, focusing mainly on issues related to the Middle East and the United Nations. She spoke with KPFA's Philip Maldery on the Sunday show about the devastating strike by Israel on Mawasi. Well, first of all, it's not at all clear that Mohammed Dave was killed. Uh, Hamas is denying it. The Israelis have not actually 
tried to claim it. What they have claimed is that his deputy, Rafa Salame, uh, who was a commander of Hamas's Khan Yunus Brigade and was the deputy to Dave, uh, was killed. The fact that they're not saying that Mohammed Dave was killed is probably an indication that he was not. Uh, whether or not he was, whether or not they thought he was there, intended to kill him, makes no difference in this context in terms of international law. This was an absolute slaughter. There's over 90 people who have been known to have been killed, more than 300 injured. The uh, UN's uh, OCHA officially, one of the uh, humanitarian aid coordinators, said that what he saw in the aftermath of those strikes was, and I quote here, the most horrific scenes I have seen in my nine months in Gaza. And given what we know has happened in Gaza in the last nine months to say that this was the most horrific is an incredible, powerful uh, reality. We should also note that this is not the most recent attack. One of the things we're not hearing much about today is that there was another strike today on a UN-run school in the Nusrat camp in central Gaza uh, and that killed at least 15 Palestinians, wounded dozens more. We don't have exact numbers. Uh, but it's now, it's the the level of death and destruction at the hands of these Israeli assaults is so extreme that an attack, again, a series of violations, an attack on a school is illegal, an attack on a UN facility is separately illegal, and an attack on civilians is illegal. Uh, whether or not you think that there happens to be some militant there, when you know that it's filled with civilians, that's illegal. All of that has been going on, and we're hearing virtually nothing about that. Uh, so it's it's a horrific situation right now. This seems to be a, a an escalation, taking us back to the the first weeks of the assaults in in Gaza, when it was tens and tens and tens and over hundred a day people being killed by these Israeli assaults. Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington. She's also author of Understanding the Palestinian Israeli Conflict, a primer. Scott Anderson, the Deputy Humanitarian Coordinator for the United Nations Palestinian Refugee Agency, UNRWA, is the agency's director in Gaza. He visited the Nasser Medical Complex, which is one of the largest hospitals in the Gaza Strip. Officials say it has not been functional since February. Anderson said the health facility was overwhelmed with 100 people injured in the Mawasi strike. There's not enough beds, hygiene supplies, sheeting, mattresses, or scrubs, and many patients were treated on the ground or on waiting room benches uh, without disinfectant. And this puts even treatable injuries at risk of sepsis, uh, ventilator systems were not working due to electrical problems. Uh, we saw toddlers who were double amputees, uh, children paralyzed and unable to receive treatment because they don't have the equipment at the hospital. Anderson said parents told him that they had moved into the so-called humanitarian zone with their children, only to be forced to move once again. He said... Nine in ten people in Gaza are displaced, and on average, people in Gaza have had to move once a month because of Israeli bombardments. He said some people cannot afford to move again and that there is no safe anywhere in Gaza. Uh, people are often only able to take whatever they can carry, and they're mostly on foot, and some are only able to carry their children, and many have lost everything, and they need everything. And as people displace more and more often, every time they lose a little bit of their wealth, a little bit of their worldly possessions. When I was in Gaza City last Friday talking to people that had displaced, they simply told me they can't afford to move anymore, that they're very much stuck where they are. Anderson said he and his team are doing what they can to increase medical capacity in Gaza and bring in basic necessities like food and water. However, he said it's been increasingly difficult for humanitarian aid workers to operate because law and order has broken down in parts of the enclave. He called for an immediate ceasefire to protect the civilians, especially those in United Nations schools and hospitals. A United Nations assessment has found that a fleet of more than 100 trucks would take 15 years 
just to clear Gaza of almost 40 million tons of rubble in an operation that would cost between 500 and 600 million dollars. The conclusions underline the immense challenge of rebuilding the Palestinian territory after months of grinding Israeli offensives that has led to massive destruction of homes and infrastructure. According to the assessment, which was published last month by the U.N. Environment Program, nearly 139,000 buildings have been damaged in Gaza, more than half of the total, and of those, just over a quarter were absolutely destroyed. Jody Jacobs has more from the United Nations. With the war still raging on, the United Nations says close to 140,000 buildings had been damaged in Gaza. Of these, it says just over a quarter were completely destroyed and about a tenth severely damaged. In May this year, the world body said that rebuilding homes in Gaza destroyed during the conflict could take until 2040, with the total cost of reconstruction across the territory costing as much as $40 billion. It says schools, health facilities, roads, sewers and other critical infrastructure have all suffered massive damage. On Monday, following days of conflict in the enclave, the Anwar headquarters was hit, its building completely destroyed. Jody Jacobs, New York. As Israeli air and naval strikes continued to pummel Gaza, the United Kingdom's new Foreign Secretary, David Lamy, reiterated his demand for a ceasefire during a visit to Jerusalem. He uh, repeated his call during his second day of meetings with Israeli officials, including a meeting with the Israeli President Isaac Herzog, as the new British Foreign Secretary continues a diplomatic push despite dwindling hopes of an immediate ceasefire. Lamy met with the family of British hostages and later joined President Herzog to meet relatives of Tamir Adar, whose body is believed to be held by Hamas militants in Gaza. Far-right members of Netanyahu's cabinet continued to demand the Israeli government refer- refrain from making any deal to end the fighting in Gaza. The finance minister, Bezalel Smotrich, said today that he opposed the release of any Palestinian prisoner as part of a ceasefire agreement. Karen Chamas with more. Britain's new foreign secretary has called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza during a visit to Israel and the Palestinian territories. David Lamy met with Israeli President Isaac Herzog in Jerusalem. The new British foreign secretary said he hoped to see a hostage deal soon and he added, I hope too that we see a ceasefire soon and we bring an alleviation to the suffering and the intolerable loss of life that we're now seeing also in Gaza. Lamy also demanded that Israel halt settlements expansion in the Israeli-occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. He also said that the Palestinian Authority needs to be reformed and empowered. Labour's stance on the Gaza war cost it votes in this month's UK election. Although the party won in a landslide, pro-Palestinian independence defeated Labour candidates in several seats with large Muslim populations. Karen Shamas, London. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky laid out plans for a second international summit to discuss ending Russia's war in Ukraine. He said Russian representatives should attend. Moscow was not invited to a summit held last month in Switzerland. Meanwhile, a survey cited by a Ukrainian newspaper said nearly 44 percent of Ukrainians support launching official peace talks with Russia, but a majority also reject Russian President Vladimir Putin's demands for an end of the war. Ukrainians living in the Russian-occupied Crimea region were not included in the survey. Russia illegally annexed the territory in 2014. Other areas of the east and south of the country under Russian control were also excluded from the survey. Magumi Lim reports from Kiev. A survey published by ZN.UA, a Ukrainian media outlet, showed an increase in the number of Ukrainians in favor of negotiations compared to last May, where only 23 percent of respondents supported entering into talks with Russia. Results varied depending on the different regions of Ukraine where the highest number of respondents in support of peace talks were from the south at 60 percent. Megumi Lim in Kyiv. 
U.S. journalist and author Masha Gessen was convicted in absentia today by a Moscow court on charges of spreading false information about the military, sentenced to eight years in prison. The Moscow-born Gessen, a staff writer for The New Yorker and a columnist for The New York Times who lives in the U.S., is a prominent critic of Russian President Putin and an award-winning writer. Russian police put Gessen on a wanted list in December. Russian media reported the case was based on statements they made about atrocities committed by Russian troops in the Ukrainian town of Bucha in an interview with a popular Russian online blogger. Prosecutions were carried out under a Russian law adopted days after the invasion of Ukraine began that effectively criminalized any public expression about the war that deviated from the Kremlin narrative. Russia maintains that its troops in Ukraine only strike military targets and not civilians. Gessen, a dual U.S.-Russian citizen, not likely to face imprisonment in Russia on the conviction unless... Gessen travels to a country with an extradition treaty with Moscow. Reaction to the attempted assassination of Donald Trump this weekend has elicited a variety of reactions from political leaders. A few, like Trump's pick for running mate, J.D. Vance, are blaming the Biden campaign. But others from both sides of the aisle are denouncing political violence and calling for less heated political rhetoric in the country. Christopher Martinez reports. The attempted assassination of Donald Trump at a campaign rally has drawn reactions from politicians of different stripes, pretty much all denouncing violence, but otherwise taking some different lessons from the event. President Joe Biden spoke from the White House Oval Office Sunday evening. My fellow Americans, I want to speak to you tonight about the need for us to lower the temperature in our politics. And to remember, while we may disagree, we are not enemies. We're neighbors, we're friends, co-workers, citizens, and most importantly, we're our fellow Americans. We must stand together. Speaking of the shooting that injured a former president, killed a citizen supporting his chosen candidate, and wounded others, Biden says we cannot afford to go down this road. Violence has never been the answer. Whether it's with members of Congress of both parties being targeted and shot, or a violent mob attacking the Capitol on January 6th, or brutal attack on the spouse of former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, or information and intimidation on election officials, or the kidnapping plot against the sitting governor, or an attempted assassination on Donald Trump. There is no place in America for this kind of violence, or for any violence ever, period. No exceptions. We can't allow this violence to be normalized. Some Republicans took a different approach. Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, who is now Trump's announced pick for vice presidential candidate, tweeted hours after the shooting, Today is not just some isolated incident. The central premise of the Biden campaign is that President Donald Trump is an authoritarian fascist who must be stopped at all costs. It goes on to say that rhetoric led directly to President Trump's attempted assassination. In fact, neither Biden nor his campaign team are known to have said Trump must be stopped at all costs. But Trump later announced his choice of Vance to be his running mate. Donald Trump Jr. spoke to CNN Monday at the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, saying his father is a fighter who was not meant to be stopped. That moment when he stood up after being shot at and just showed resolve to keep fighting for this country. That, that was everything for me. I, I just literally told him, I go, you're the biggest badass I know. <laughs> and uh, so we had some jokes about that. that. That was the first thing I thought to think of even in that moment. Another Trump son, Eric Trump, was also at the Republican convention. Well, it's been a pretty somber mood, right? I mean, my father got shot at. Somebody took off half his ear. Um, but I can tell you, my father's never been more determined than he is right now. He is, um, he's more determined to make America great again. He's, um, he's got incredible fighting spirit, no different than when he's pumping his hand in the air with blood running across his face, and uh, I'm really proud of him. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, an ardent supporter and longtime friend of Trump, said on NBC's Sunday program Meet the Press that he wishes he were surprised, but he says he's been worrying about this for a long time. For the country, we probably need to do some soul-searching as a nation. 
That's a sentiment independent Senator Bernie Sanders seems to agree with. He also spoke on Meet the Press, saying we need discussion of issues, not the harsh rhetoric of recent years. Uh, the bottom line is what we need as a nation, what a democracy is about, is not radical rhetoric. What it is about is a serious discussion of where we are as a nation and how we go forward. You know, in, in a certain way, Kristen, politics should be kind of boring. As for Trump, he told a Washington Examiner reporter that he rewrote his speech for the Republican National Convention to focus on unity. That's a message President Biden habitually makes at his speeches. And Biden made it again in his Oval Office speech, saying unity is the most elusive of goals right now. But he says nothing is more important. Disagreement is inevitable in American democracy. It's part of human nature. But politics must never be a literal battlefield, and God forbid, a killing field. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This music break is brought to you by Transitions on Traditions with host Greg Bridges, which airs Mondays at 8 p.m. We now return to the Pacifica Evening News. A second phase of the National Rifle Association's corruption trial in New York got underway today. A judge is to determine whether the NRA's former leadership should face non-monetary penalties for misspending the prominent gun organization's money. Earlier this year, a jury found longtime NRA head Wayne LaPierre squandered millions of dollars of the group's money to fund his lavish lifestyle. He was ordered to pay the organization $4.35 million in damages. Now, Judge Joel Cohen will decide whether any other relief against LaPierre, the NRA, and another executive should be awarded. New York Attorney General Letitia James sued the NRA and its top leadership in 2020. Donna Water reports. New York Attorney General Letitia James wants an independent monitor to oversee the NRA, and she wants former NRA CEO Wayne LaPierre banned from serving in leadership positions for or collecting funds on behalf of any charitable organization doing business in New York. In February, a jury found that LaPierre misspent millions of dollars of NRA money in order to fund an extravagant lifestyle and that he failed to properly manage the NRA's assets, omitted or misrepresented information in the organization's tax filings, and violated whistleblower protections under New York law. A lawyer for the NRA says the request for a court-appointed monitor is unwarranted. The second phase of the civil trial will not be heard by a jury, but by a judge. I'm Donna Water. The jury in the bribery trial of New York Senator Bob Menendez today finished its second day of deliberations without a verdict. The New York jury resumes its work tomorrow. Jurors in the Manhattan federal court sent a note today to the judge wanting to know if unanim unanimity was required to acquit on a single count, the New Jersey Democrat is charged in 16 of 18 counts. 70-year-old Menendez has denied he engaged in a bribery scheme from 2018 to 2023 with three New Jersey businessmen, including by serving as a foreign agent for the government of Egypt. He and two businessmen who allegedly paid him bribes of gold and cash have pled not guilty. Julie Walker reports from New York. Jurors deliberating Senator Bob Menendez's bribery trial in Manhattan Federal Court sent a note to the judge asking, 
Does a not guilty verdict on a single count require unanimity? After consulting with lawyers in the case, the judge responded, jury, your note, whether guilty or not guilty, must be unanimous as to each count and to each defendant. The New Jersey Democrat is charged in 16 of 18 counts. The 70-year-old Menendez has denied he engaged in a bribery scheme with three New Jersey businessmen, including by serving as a foreign agent for the government of Egypt. He and two of the businessmen who allegedly paid him bribes of gold and cash have pled not guilty. Julie Walker, New York. The Richmond City Council has voted unanimously in a special meeting to authorize a letter of intent from the East Bay Regional Park District to the city of Richmond seeking to acquire more than 80 acres of shoreline for a new public park. Chloe Behrens explains. Point Melati is a 413-acre headland on Richmond's shoreline that the city would like to set aside for parkland. The city purchased the land in 2003 from the Navy, who used it to store fuel and for naval housing. Over the past 100 years or so, it's also been home to a historic wine port and a Chevron refinery. Richmond City Council member Gail McLaughlin said during the council meeting that she fought for over 20 years for this outcome. For the first four years I was in office, I was the only voice on the council who was advocating for this site to come into public hands and to remain in public hands. And while for years I was the only voice on the council, I wasn't alone in the community. I was side by side with the many great community advocates who never gave up on this dream to turn the land into a major public park with park-friendly amenities, a park that will serve our residents, our visitors, and our planet. Point Melati is a natural shoreline habitat for Dungeness crab, leopard sharks, and over 160 species of birds, once home to Ohlone and Miwok tribes. In 2004, negotiations were underway with developer Jim Levine, owner of Upstream Point Melati LLC, and the Gittaville Indian tribe to convert the land into a casino. Dave Alishire is the Richmond City Attorney. He said the casino idea did not align with the needs of Richmond residents, who voted against it in November 2010. That spurred a federal lawsuit. The amended judgment provided that the city would have an opportunity to find a developer for the property and that the land value would be shared 50-50 between the tribe and the city. And that if by a certain date, an agreement was not reached with a developer, then the tribe got the ability to purchase the property for $400 and the tribe would have five years to find a developer. Former Richmond Mayor Tom Butt supported a plan to develop a 1,200-unit housing project on the land. The developer failed to produce a feasible plan to finance the $45 million project, and in June of 2022, the city sold Point Melati to the Gittaville Indian tribe for $400 with a five-year window to find their own developer. City Attorney Alishire said the city council encouraged the tribe to consider selling to a nonprofit or public entity. The tribe was free to find a developer and try, try and find the best economic return. That was their right. What the council put out there was that we wanted to initiate a process to find a public or nonprofit who would use it for park, recreation, open space purposes. So it was the council's vision two years ago, to try and find such an entity instead of an entity that was going to develop for the greatest economic return, the council wanted to find the greatest social and uh, community benefit return. California State Senator Nancy Skinner sponsored a $36 million state grant for the East Bay Regional Parks District to step in and turn it into a park. With this windfall, city officials offered the Gittaville tribe $40 million to buy the land. Alishire says that move put the council in a difficult position. The tribe said the only way they make that deal is they're not willing to do a 50-50 split. And they said that 
if the city surrendered its share, it would create enough economic value back to the tribe that they would go with the lower price of the 40 million and they would consider selling to the district. Ultimately, the city made the decision to agree to these terms so that the plan could proceed. The authorized letter of intent will now go to the Coastal Conservancy along with an appraisal to support the sale. The Coastal Conservancy will decide on whether to okay the sale in September. The council says they hope to close escrow on the Point Malati sale by the end of the year. For KPFA News, I'm Chloe Behrens in Richmond. The mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma, has announced that a World War I veteran is the first person identified from graves filled with more than 100 victims of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre that devastated the city's black community. Mayor G.T. Bynum said officials from a forensic lab using DNA from descendants of his brothers identified the remains of C.L. Daniel from Georgia. He was in his 20s when he was killed. A white mob massacred as many as 300 black people over the span of two days in 1921, a long-suppressed episode of racial violence that destroyed a thriving community known as Black Wall Street and ended with thousands of black residents forced into internment camps overseen by the National Guard. Reporter Ed Donahue has more. The first victim of the 1921 Tulsa massacre of the city's black community has been identified. A white mob massacred as many as 300 black people over the span of two days in 1921 in Tulsa. More than 120 graves were found during searches that began in 2020. Forensic analysis and DNA were collected from about 30 sets of remains. The first to be identified, C.L. Daniel, was a veteran who served our country in World War I. Tulsa Mayor G.T. Bynum says it's believed Daniel was in his 20s. Oklahoma State archaeologist Carrie Stackelbeck says there was no sign of bullet wounds. They forced him into a casket that was too small for his stature. They had to bend his legs somewhat at the knee in order to get him to fit. A lawsuit by the two known living survivors of the Tulsa massacre, ages 110 and 109, was dismissed by the Oklahoma Supreme Court last month. I'm Ed Donahue. California Governor Gavin Newsom has signed a law barring school districts from passing policies requiring schools to notify parents if their child asks to change their gender identification. The law bans rules requiring school staff to disclose a student's gender identity or sexual orientation to any other person without the child's permission. Proponents of the legislation say it will help protect LGBTQ students who live in unwelcoming households. Extreme weather events are still affecting many areas of the United States. Rita Foley reports. Fierce heat thunderstorms, possible hail, flash flooding, damaging winds. It's all in the forecast somewhere across the nation. Parts of the Midwest may see thunderstorms, flash flooding, hail, and gusty winds today. There may be an isolated tornado or two in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois. Thunderstorms are in the forecast across the Northeast and the heat. Some places will challenge all-time records. In the Southeast, very warm and humid, and the miserable heat wave is continuing along the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast coast. The temperature could hit 100 degrees in Washington, D.C. today, 107 in Las Vegas. I'm Rita Foley. Morning clouds clearing by the afternoon around the San Francisco Bay Area tonight with highs in the mid to the upper 60s. Further inland, partly cloudy skies with highs in the low 80s. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, sunny skies with a high predicted of 101. That's it for the news tonight. For this Monday, July 15th, I'm Mark Miracle. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Tune in Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. That's Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org.
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Thank you.